Welcome back to Elevator Inspiration for Sunday School. Hey, we have a unique lesson uh, today. This lesson is the last lesson of this quarter and it is entitled Hope in the Day of the Lord. Hope in the Day of the Lord. This is lesson 13. It's going to be taught on May the 28th. And this, as I noticed, stated last, is this is the last lesson of a call to holy living. So, I wanted to ask this question. And I want you to think about this question. What are your first thoughts when you hear the words, the day of the Lord? What do you think about when you hear someone say, the day of the Lord? What, what do you think about? Okay, so we actually have four outlines. And the first outline is believe God's word. And this is coming from 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4 is the first outline, but we're going to go all the way down, I think, to the verse 17. So let me move so we can actually get a, a smaller view of this, a bigger view of the slide and a lesser view of my picture. All right, so the first verse, Paul started out saying, this is the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. Now, evidently, he could have written first epistle, but it could have been a uh, epistle that maybe was lost. However, Paul is saying, this is the second time I'm writing to you. And he noticed how he used the word beloved. I like that. And then he says, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So sometimes we got to get stirred up. So as believers, do we think as others that world affairs will always continue as they are and God will never intervene in human history again? That's what Peter is trying to stir up. So look at verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, the apostles. So he identified, Peter identified himself, and later on he's going to talk about Paul. He identified himself as apostles. So this is the New Testament apostles. The Old Testament, we have prophets. So he's saying, be mindful of those words, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers. Then he identified that. Now notice what scoffers are. They are false teachers who mock the truth. Notice now, false teachers who mock the truth. Now, let's talk about what is the truth. Because it says here that scoffers are gonna come, they're gonna be walking after their own lust and saying, this is what they're gonna be saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is the promise? Where, where all these prophecies that you are talking about what has happened to them? Where are they? Why they haven't been fulfilled? So what is my takeaway? My takeaway, I go to Hebrew 1 and 2. This is from the Living Bible, and it says, But now in these days he has spoken to us through his Son, to whom he has given everything, and through whom he has made the world and everything there he is. So we're living in the last days, yes. But notice now, he says, in these days have he spoken to us through his son. So the last day started when Christ came on scene. He initiated the last days. All events has happening since he has died on the cross and, raised and, and, and was risen from um, um, the grave. And now he sits on the right hand of the Father. Everything now is considered last days. Keep that in mind now. Because people say, oh yeah, we're living in the last days. Well, we've been living in the last days ever since Christ have gone back to heaven. Okay, I just want to just say that. I, I like that. So the next outline is believe in God's creation. This is verses 5 through 9, again, of 2 Peter 3, uh, the third chapter. Now, this is intentionally ignoring God's creation. You can actually look at the creation and you can see God's handiwork. Notice verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. This I'm talking about scoffers now. False teachers that by the word of God the heavens were of old. The earth standing out of water and in the water. Go back to Genesis. Tahu wabuhu. In other words, that's the Greek correction. That's the Hebrew word where they existed. 
when God, it says, moved up on the waters. Back in Genesis, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then it says how he moved up on the waters. It was muddy waters, Tahu Wabuhu. And what he's saying here is that the earth is standing out of the waters and in the water, whereby the world that, that then was being overflowed with water perish. Tahu Wabuhu. I, I like that word. So in other words, everything was was murky. It was a swamp land. And if you go back into Revelation, you'll notice that Satan was cast out of heaven to earth. Everywhere Satan goes, he create havoc. And the earth was just like that. And notice verse 7, it says, But the heaven and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept and store reserve unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. So God came and he spoke. And the world that we're living in was created from his spoken word. Now, what it's saying here is that verse 7, but the heavens, I like that S on it, and the earth, which we are now living in, the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. So that day of judgment is going to come and fire is going to destroy everything. However, God created everything by the spoken word and that judgment day is going to come because of the perdition of the ungodly men. And then verse eight, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. This, I quote this verse often that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Time is irrelevant to God. Think about that. See, to God, time is irrelevant. A one day, he can do just as much that man can do in a thousand years. God can do it in one day. And then verse nine, he is not slight concerning his promise. Oh, as some men count slightness, but as long suffering to us, not willing that any shall perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, he's not going, he's going to remember his promise. He's going to exercise his promise. And the reason why he has not come back is because he want all should come to repentance. So what is my takeaway? My takeaway is this. By the same word that created the world and brought the flood, that's what he's talking about. God will intervene in human history again by destroying the present heavens and earth with fire and bring the day of judgment. So believers should remember that God can do in one day what it would take humans a thousand years to do. So remember that many are waiting. We must remember that many are waiting on God. I like this, but God is actually waiting on them. If you notice in Genesis, I think it's the sixth chapter when he's talk to, uh, talking about Noah in those days, he actually waited 120 years when Noah started preaching for the people to come to him. God is waiting on us. We're not waiting on him. Okay. Next outline is believe in God's promise. This is verses 10 through 13. And if you notice here in verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to happen so quick in which the heavens shall pass away. Our great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also works and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I've been thinking about this verse. So the day of the Lord, think about this for a few minutes. And in, in, in across America, even across the world, there are cities that are have skyscrapers that are reaching into heaven. And that's what it's saying here. Heaven shall pass away in a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Boy, I can see cities are turning to just melting away those skyrocket buildings that with all the concrete is going to melt away. And then it says the earth also and the works, everything, the highways, all what we can think of all the works that man have done is going to be burned up. And then verse 11, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, dissolved. Now, Peter says, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What manner of person should you be? 
if you realize that the day of the Lord is going to come with fervent heat and burn everything up, what kind of conversation? How should we be living? In verse 12, looking for and hasten unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. It use that word dissolve again. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. What type? How should we be acting if that's going to take place? And then verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, there it is again, promise, look for a new heavens with an S on it and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So if you notice now, everything that we have right now that we are seeing is going to dissolve away. And that phrase, day of the Lord, refers specifically to the coming of the great tribulation period when God will govern the affairs of man more directly and open than he does at this present moment. We're living in the age of grace. So we see God passive wrath. But that day is going to come, the day of the Lord, when we're going to actually see not the passes, but the active wrath of God. So what is my takeaway? A new heaven. Correction. New heavens. I need to take that A off. New heavens and a new earth refers to a promise God made to his people in Isaiah 65. For behold, I create new heavens with an S on it and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into our man. Everything that we have now is not going to be remembered because we're going to, we're going to be living in a in the new heavens. I don't know why I want to say a in the new heavens and a new earth. Okay, the last outline. Last outline is peace, be at peace with him. And this is verses 14 and 15. It says, Wherefore, beloved, Seeing that ye look for such thing, be diligent. We know we talked about that word a couple weeks ago. And that ye be found of him in peace without spot or blemish. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament. The sacrificial animals. Remember, they had to be without a spot or the blemish. Likewise, we, that are New Testament believers, must overcome more defects and repent of our sin. And that's how we become without a spot or blemish. And notice I mentioned about Paul, verse 15, an account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. So in other words, the Lord delays his coming intentionally. So to give us time to repent of sin and come to salvation. That's what it's all about. That's why I always say that God give us a lifetime to get it right. So what did I get from this? I wrote this out as my lesson learned. Think about delays. As travelers, we all know delays are annoying. Whether it's a flight delay, a train delay, a bus delay, it can cause frustration and stress. But despite the inconvenience, delays are a fight of life. They can sometimes make the optimum use of a given situa situation. The timing of God is precise. God is always on time. So we must have faith that the end results will produce in a new heaven and a new earth. If the delay is one day or a thousand years, these delays are a blessing in disguise. So as a fellow believer, I I'll think about myself when I wrote this. I must use delays as an opportunity to reflect and reset my perspective leading to strengthening my faith and trust in God. So my thought to remember, delays produce spot, spotless and blameless believers. That's what we are aiming for, to be spotless and blameless. Think about that. Let's spend a few moments on reflections. The key verse was verse nine. The Lord is not slight concerning his promise. Not promises now, his promise. As some men count slightness, 
But God is long suffering to us, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. These are powerful words when you think about it. See, God promised that he's going to destroy this world. Everything is going to dissolve. We know that's going to happen. And if we know that's going to happen, what manner of man we should be doing right now? Should we be about our business or should we be about God's business? If we know that what we're working on is going to be dissolved, why do we put so much effort in trying to please self? Trying to satisfy self. Because God is not slight concerning his promise. Think about that. This was a great lesson. Like I said, this is the last lesson of this quarter. And I think it is something to think about. And like I always say, God give us a lifetime to get it right. Let us end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a true promise keeper. Your word is precious and holy to us and for us. We believe and trust that Jesus is coming back for us. And we wait for great joy and anticipation that he will return. And we will travel back with him in the cloud. Because you are coming back, Lord. And we want to be ready to go back with you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hey, you all, I appreciate you all joining me. And like I always say, see you in Sunday school. I've had some people to actually uh, uh, write and say they would like to give. And I'm putting this up there. This is, again, as our Sunday school uh, at Abbeville Memorial Church. And you can give by using the cash app there or using Zelle with the email. Again, I sure appreciate you for joining in. And if you like this, let me encourage you to hit the button so you know that when I uh, upload another one and please share with your friends. Again, see you in Sunday School.